our last lesson, we learned that when you were baptized into Christ, you were raised and made alive unto God, sensitive to God, able to hear him, discern him, and to please him. God, after all, is a living God and has no dead children. There are no stillbirths in the kingdom of God. God has no pleasure in anyone that draws back from him. He only delights in those that come near to him in a willing heart to embrace the truth and to obey and please him. In your baptism, you are raised up to do precisely that and have now been made acceptable unto God. Your mandate from heaven, reckon yourself to be alive unto God and dead unto sin. And let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. We now come to the conclusion of one of the most practical and beneficial studies available to men, that of God's word on baptism. Such a practical help it is. I trust that you have been able to perceive it by faith and able to go on your way rejoicing like that Ethiopian eunuch of old. Great things have been identified with your baptism, such great things that they merit mentioning once again. Your baptism has been associated with salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It has been associated with washing, with cleansing, with being made pure in God's sight. Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. It is identified with forgiveness. <clears throat> Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. God has forgiven all trespasses. And by virtue of that fact, the law has been blotted out. In your baptism, it can no longer condemn those that are in Christ Jesus. The law cannot deal with a justified, purged person. In your baptism, you have experienced the circumcision of Christ, where Christ has cut off the body of the sins of the flesh. The whole sinful nature, in God's consideration, has been cut off, disassociated from your person, so that you are no longer enslaved to it, but can live unto God. In your baptism, you found an entrance into Christ's death. You are baptized into his death, and everything the word of God has to say about Christ's death, about being reconciled by it, justified by it, procuring peace by his death, Satan being destroyed by his death, and the enemies of our soul, principalities and powers being spoiled by it, all of those benefits are yours because you've been baptized into Christ's death. You have now put on Christ and have thus experienced becoming a partaker of the divine nature, appropriating the very character of God and are now viewed by God Almighty as his son and by Christ as his brother. You have been baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're in them and they are in you. You have received the Holy Spirit of God when you were baptized. God sent him forth into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Now I ask you, as a considered intelligent person, could there possibly be a more impressive list of benefits than these? Baptism has not just merely been associated with some benefits, but with the greatest benefits known to man. The most central and pivotal truths of Scripture have been tied to your baptism. You have every reason to be optimistic about the future and to be joyful about the present. It seems to me that in closing, a clear statement about your completeness in Christ is in order. And the apostle affirmed that you're complete in Christ in one of our texts that we've used throughout this series, the second chapter of Colossians, verses 10 through 12. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him by baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. Here, because you are baptized into Christ, you are authorized by the Holy Spirit of God to be confident of your completeness and thoroughness in Christ Jesus. Now, our completeness in him is founded upon his exaltation. He is, as the text said, the head of all principality and power. Christ is exalted far above every name that's been named, not only in this world, but the world that is to come. And because of that, those that are in Christ 
And you that have been baptized into him are in Christ. Those in him are complete, thorough. Nothing is lacking. Think for a moment of the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 and verse 9 affirms that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. That is to say, Jesus Christ is the most comprehensive revelation of God that has ever been given to mankind. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God, a complete and thorough representation of God. He represents the way God thinks, the way God works, the way God thinks about you and what God has for you. A candid study of the Gospels will reveal to you what God is like. When you see Jesus being compassionate upon the multitudes, you know that God is compassionate. When you see Jesus ready and willing to forgive, you know God is ready and willing to forgive. When you see Jesus reluctant to destroy men's lives and affirming he did not come to destroy men but to save them, you know that God does not delight in the destruction of the wicked, but rather to, th to their salvation, bringing them to himself. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily, corporately, in, a, in an observable form in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God was brought within the range of man's senses. He was able to see and to touch, as John said in his first epistle, to touch and handle the word of life. He became accessible to men. And now as you read the Gospels, we have an index into the character of God and of his willingness and earnestness to save the race of man. Jesus Christ is the head of all principality and power. That's what Colossians 2.10 says. If there's anything aligned against us, and there is, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. But Jesus Christ is the head over all of these powers and principalities. Peter proclaimed in 1 Peter 3.22 that angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. They do his bidding. And when they intrude upon your life and you live by faith, he rebukes the devourer for your sake and keeps you safe in the kingdom of God. Let me urge you to depend upon him to deliver you from evil. Did not Jesus teach us to pray? Deliver us from evil. Jesus Christ has the power to do that because he's over all opposing forces. The forces then that are aligned against you are under him. And you are in him who's the head over all. He's been exalted to the right hand of God. Hebrews 1 and verse 3 tells us that after he had purged by himself our sins, he sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And there at the right hand of God, he is the mediator of the new covenant. There he speaks in your behalf. He intercedes to God. He represents mankind to God. And every time God looks at Jesus, he thinks favorably and lovingly of all those that are in Christ Jesus. I think of a text in Romans, the eighth chapter and verse 34, that show us the practical, practical benefits of Jesus Christ being exalted to the right hand of God. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that has risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In a series of accelerated terms of joy, not only did Jesus die, but he moved on from there and rose from the dead. Not only was he raised from the dead, but he was exalted to God's right hand. But he is not passively at God's right hand. He's interceding for us there. You are complete in this one. You have been baptized into the person that is sitting at God's right hand and with whom God is well pleased, an exalted Savior. He is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Hebrews 10 and verse 13 for all opposing forces to be brought down in open subjection to him. Till as the Philippian letter puts it, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now this will occur because Jesus is in fact superior. 
He is head over all. The one into whom you have been baptized is over all, God blessed forever. Now let us consider Jesus and the people of God. For God cannot think of Christ without thinking of those that are in Christ. He is the exalted one into whom we have been baptized. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ, into the exalted one, into the one who is head over all, into the one that makes you complete. Viewed from an objective point of view, what has been accomplished when you come into Christ is you became a member of his body. Ephesians 5 and verse 30 tells us we are of his body, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. That is, in God's eyes, Christ and his people are indistinguishable. They are so closely wed together that God cannot think of Christ without thinking of Christ's brethren, you, and he cannot think of you without thinking of Christ. What a glorious benefit that is. You must be persuaded of your acceptance with the living God. 1 Corinthians 6, chapter and verse 17 enlarges upon this subjective view of what occurred when you were baptized into Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit and a more intimate contact there cannot possibly be. This is the most precise of all unions. One spirit, and it has occurred between you and the Lord. You are complete in him. Again, in 1 John, the fifth chapter and verse 20, this confession is made. And you are in him. That is true. Isn't that a wonderful benefit? Baptized into Christ and in him. That is true, and who is the head of all principality and power. And can we ever forget how our Heavenly Father views us? We are Christ's brethren. He is the firstborn among many brethren. You are Christ's brother. And Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother because you have the same Father. God has sanctified him and he has sanctified you. On one occasion, the Lord Jesus said, Behold, I ascend to my God and your God, to my Father and to your Father. So you have been joined to the one who is head over all. That's how you're complete in him. Things that are experienced in him are the subjective view. You have been completely justified in Christ. You are complete in him. In Romans, the eighth chapter and verse one, the Holy Spirit affirms there is therefore now no condemnation, none, to them who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.34 challenges the world and challenges all of hell and as it were all of heaven and says, Who is he that condemneth? Let him step forth. Is there a personality in all the universe, in the earth, above the earth, under the earth, that can condemn the person who is in Christ? Nay, there is not a one. You are complete in him, so thoroughly justified that there is not a valid voice in all of God's universe that can condemn you. Praise God for that benefit. You have been completely renewed. You are complete in him. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and verse 17, the word of the Lord says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The world looks different when you're in Christ. God looks different in Christ. Everything has become new, completely new. You are complete in him. In Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 6, the word of the Lord tells us that we are accepted in the Beloved. He, God, has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's Christ. You are completely accepted. When you come to God, God will not turn you away. You're accepted. There is no deficiency in Christ Jesus, no lack of acceptance in him. And you have been baptized into Christ. 
you have by being baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And the affirmation of Scripture is you are complete in Him. That is to say God finds no fault in you. Well, you say, I have a lot of faults, but they're not faults in Christ. The part of you that's in Him is the part you want to honor and to give heed to and to thank God for. In Christ, you are completely anchored, stabilized, fortified to live in this present evil world. In the book of Colossians, the first chapter in verse 23, the apostle comments on this completeness. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now you that have been baptized into Christ, reach back into the past. Think of the time when you were baptized. Mark it as it were on your calendar and contemplate it. At that time you are persuaded that the gospel applied to you. You knew in your heart, you were persuaded, you were convinced that if you obeyed the Lord, you would experience the remission of sins. No question about it. You would be received of God. So you arose and you were baptized, washing away your sins. Now proceed today on that same basis. You are still accepted by him because you were baptized into Christ and you are complete in him. If ever you are prone to doubt this, Reach back into the past, into the arsenal of reality, and recall when you obeyed the gospel and say, I was baptized into Christ and God accepts me in the beloved. And then go on and live from there in an awareness of that truth. That is the truth. Colossians, the second chapter, verses 6 and 7, refers to this stability once again. As ye have therefore received... Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein in thanksgiving. When was it that you received Christ Jesus the Lord? When you were baptized into him. You were baptized into Christ. You became a partaker of Christ. You received Christ at that time. Now, in the same manner, walk in Christ. Walk as you have received him. You are complete in Christ. Just as you were complete in him when you were baptized into him, you completely eradicated the past. You were completely forgiven. Even so now, this very day, you are completely equipped to live godly in this present evil world. In Christ Jesus, you have been merged with deity. You are compatible with God. And if you will live by faith, God will join with you in the enterprise of living. Nothing, you see, is lacking in Christ. You are complete in Him. Now, we cannot end here without mentioning your personal responsibility. And rather than responsibility being discouraging, it ought to be encouraging. This is where God permits us to join personally in this work. You have a personal responsibility to respond to the truths that you have heard in these lessons. To go on to perfection, as Hebrews 6 and verse 1 says. Not to let it end here. You see, believer, it's a reproach to God and a reproach to His salvation to linger on the doorstep of that salvation. God has saved you to bring you on to higher and more nobler things. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. Be zealous enough to fight for the salvation which you have in Christ Jesus. Now in this series of lessons, we have covered some of the most wonderful truths that I have personally ever known. They are precious to me because they have liberated me from death and trespasses and sins. They have alerted me to my life in Christ. Let me just briefly refresh your mind with some of the things that we've discussed. We have taught you that your baptism is associated with salvation, that in Christ Jesus 
This act of obedience in which you engaged identified you with the salvation Jesus captains, authors, and finishes. We also taught you that your sins have been washed away, separated from you. Your past, however sordid it is, however terrible it is, you really don't have to think about it in any other way than that it's been washed away done away by the blood of Christ when you were baptized. In lesson number three, we learn that you have been forgiven by God. What a wonderful, wonderful contemplation. God does not hold your sins against you. You have been forgiven all trespasses, as Colossians 2.13 states. Then that wonderful pronouncement that in your baptism he blotted out what was against you. The law of commandments contained in ordinances that was contrary to you. That condemned you. He took condemnation out of the way. So even the holy, righteous, spiritual law of God cannot condemn you now. It cannot judge you now. You have been justified by the blood of Christ and have been acquitted, as it were, of all of your sins that are guiltless before God. The law in its condemning power has been nullified. You have experienced in your baptism the circumcision of Christ. Christ has come in and separated you completely from your old past, from the sinful nature. Now, from a practical point of view, what this means is you're not a debtor to the flesh to live after the flesh. You don't have to sin. You don't have to experience cyclical Christianity up and down affair. He has separated you from the dominion of sin and announces to you, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. We then saw that we are baptized into Christ's death. All of the wonderful associations of Christ's death as proclaimed by the apostles. Reconciliation, justification, peace, the destruction of the devil. I cannot help but rejoice in that. That by death he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He delivered to him a mortal bruise that shall spell his demise. And you've been baptized into that death, made a participator in it. So that benefit accrues to you. In Christ's death, he spoiled principalities and powers, robbing them of their authority and power. So no longer are you subservient to the powers of darkness. You can overcome them and rise up into the heavenly places by faith where they are absolutely powerless. You are invincible in heavenly places in Christ. But if you dwell in their terrain, in the world where truth is not present and where the lie dominates, they are invincible. So rise up, child of God. Rise up and set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We were baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We actually were brought into the Godhead. Now the Father is in us and we're in Him. Jesus is in us, we're in Him. The Holy Spirit is in us, we in Him. It's a mind-boggling truth, but it is the truth. Lay hold of it in Jesus' name. You have put on Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put him on. Now in God's sight, you have been identified with Jesus, the Holy Son of God. As he contemplates Jesus, he sees you also. You have appropriated the divine character. Heaven's resources are yours. We learned then in that wonderful lesson that told us we have received the Holy Spirit of God. Let this not be controversial with you. God has given unto us his Holy Spirit to take the heavenly characteristics and plant them in your soul, the fruit of the Spirit, the characteristics of God, so that you can live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world. The Holy Spirit of God will confirm to you your sonship and make you confident of being accepted of God. You have also been raised and made alive, sensitive to God. If you can just get your mind set on the right thing, if you can view your baptism properly and reckon yourself to be alive indeed unto God and dead indeed unto sin, 
If you can do that, believer, you will have the victory. For this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You do, you do have the capacity to please God and to respond to Him. And then lastly, this, this current lesson that we've had. You are complete in Him. There is no deficiency in Christ. It is true there are charlatans out there that would try and bring you away from Christ and leave the insinuation that you are not complete. But dear believer, you are complete. You are complete in Him. Let no man deceive you. 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter and verse 12 says, Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Now it's true in a sense you have eternal life now. He that believeth hath everlasting life. But you have the first fruits, the beginning of it. The bulk of your life is up there ahead yet. And if you fight the fight of faith, you'll make it. You'll make it, pilgrim. You'll lay hold of eternal life. Be zealous enough to wage a good warfare as a good soldier. Well, my brothers and sisters, we've taken a long journey together in a very vital area. We have seen your baptism as one of the most wonderful resources available to you. You do not have to pretend at this point. As you contemplate your baptism, you can actually consider the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, and it can give you the liberty to live acceptably to God. Now my prayer to you and for you is that you have come to value your personal obedience to God, that it has a, taken a high priority in your life, that you will come to see it as a source of comfort and of joy. And I would in this closing moment ask you to make me a promise and to keep it faithfully. Fellow believer in Christ, will you promise to meet me in heaven? Godspeed to you, and I love you.